Good morning and welcome to day two of our Youth Ministry Now conference. It's been a privilege of mine to have an opportunity to work with Miroslav Wolf over the past 10 years, uh, the Wright Professor of Theology here at Yale Divinity School, where his headline identity is probably systematic theologian and where he's renowned around the world as a systematic theologian. But here's why this systematic theologian is so incredibly important to our venture with respect to youth ministries. Miroslav has had a heart for the church throughout his scholarship. And while he has written and taught at the most erudite levels to advance the questions that are at the forefront of theological inquiry, he's also always had a heart for writing in a way that's accessible to churches, folks in the pews, and pastors. He's widely respected both in what we might call evangelical circles and what we might call mainline Protestant circles and everything in between. He speaks to, is received by, and understands the heart of churches across that breadth. Miroslav has been working ever since a project that Lily, the Lilly Endowment generously funded called Faith is a Way of Life uh, about 10 years ago. Faith is a Way of Life was about how do we drive Christian reflection and resources out of Sunday morning into the week of our parishioners? How does Christianity frame and resource and give you an opportunity to reflect on your work, on your family, on your participation in the public sphere, in social justice, in raising money, how you spend money, everything across the spheres of life. And the question was, how can we drive this into seminaries so that they prepare pastors? I know all of you who said that you were a pastor. You were very well equipped by your seminary to address these issues, right? Uh, how, can we, how can we inspire seminaries to equip pastors to preach and teach on these spheres of life and the intersection of Christianity with each of the spheres of a lived life? How can we help folks who are not just in seminary but out there practicing? How can we help our lay folk? with this. So that was the Faith as a Way of Life project. That has been followed in his work with an extraordinary colloquium uh, that he's been gathering for the last two and a half years called God and Human Flourishing. And this has been gathering major theologians from around the country and the world, uh, local folks that you would know from, uh, from the Yale universe like Nicholas Walterstorff and David Kelsey and David Hare, John Hare, etc., what, is, what are our scriptural resources for a vision God has for flourishing life? And how might we then equip pastors, seminarians, youth ministers, etc., to speak into not just metaphysical questions, not just scriptural questions, but how both the theology and the scriptural warrants support a vision of the life that's worth living, the life that is led well and goes well uh, in, the Christian, in the Christian vocation. And that is moving towards, as you'll hear today, I think, the creation of resources not only for seminaries and not only for youth groups, but also for universities. So next spring, Miroslav will be teaching a life worth living class for Yale undergraduates. And the intellectual capital that's getting developed by God and human flourishing, I think you can see how that goes right into our program at the Center for Faith and Culture around adolescent faith and flourishing. And I think you can see how that drives also into preaching and teaching as well as education of folks in, in university settings. So this is why I think you, uh, Miroslav is a unique resource, an invaluable resource to the churches and to the academy. Miroslav, are we ready to go? Then I'm going to introduce Miroslav Wolf to you so that you can listen to him instead of to me. So what I propose to do is I propose to give you um, a kind of a bit of a diagnosis in terms of where we are uh, when it comes to the whole question of life worth living uh, in the first part and then in the second, second part after a break to take up uh, the kind of the role um, of the churches, so of religious communities, but in particularly the churches in terms of how to promote, uh, how to think about ourselves with regard to that issue and how to promote that uh, in our own settings. Now, I, I'm no a youth worker. Uh, I uh, am, and my I start stuttering uh, as soon as I start thinking about youth work. <laughs> 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 let alone, let alone actually doing it. Uh, and my my absolutely worst experience. Uh, as a public speaker, it uh, doesn't have to do with youth, but it has to, uh, has, uh, to do with addressing, I think, about eight-year-old kids. 
somewhere in Sweden, for whatever reason, I w when, I, when I was, uh, I think, in my early, early 20s, I was invited to, to travel through Sweden. I was preaching and doing different things there. And then one of the things that I was supposed to do is, I don't know whose idea it was, to address this uh, uh, eight-year-old. And I was standing in front of these eight-year-olds, had absolutely zero things to say, and whatever I said didn't make any sense to me, didn't make any sense to them. It was an unmitigated disaster, right? <laughs> So I won't have much to say about youth work, but you know about it much more than I do. I think my service to you, if I have one, is to, to think about grand issues uh, that we need to keep before us, uh, the kind of translation uh, work or how that applies to your particular setting will be something that you would know much better than I do. Um, so uh, what I want to do before I start this kind of diagnostic comments about, um, about the topic of life worth living and how it bears upon our ministry is um, I want to <coughs> go back to, uh, to Socrates. Um, Socrates is a great figure in intellectual and I think spiritual history of humanity who has raised this question of, uh, of how one lives one's life uh, well in a very powerful way. And in particular, I think for today's setting where we find ourselves uh, today, uh, one of his uh, Plato's dialogues, and Socrates is of course main protagonist in the dialogue, but one of the Plato's dialogues is called Georgias. And in that dialogue, Socrates addresses, uh, or Plato addresses, we can't quite be sure, right, who's, who's talking, right? Which, is it the Plato, Soc Plato projecting himself onto Socrates to get authority? Is it Socrates? It doesn't matter to us, right? Uh, it's completely irrelevant. Let the scholars spend their uh, uh <laughs> time figuring this out. We have more important things uh, to do, namely to ask what the substance of the issue is. And the substance of the issue of this dialogue <coughs> goes something, li something like this. He, he takes up the whole idea of um, life being guided, <coughs> life of human beings guided by what is pleasing. And he looks at it and says, well, lots of people organize their whole lives around what is pleasing to them. And then he kind of analyzes this whole thing and proposes an alternative way of thinking about what makes life worth living. And so then he looks at various domains of life, pol politics, uh, culinary arts, <laughs> gymnastics, uh, that deals with, uh, with the body, right? And describes all of them as flatterers. <laughs> you can see how it fits with some of these, right? <laughs> uh, basically, flatterer is the one who does everything so that you would be pleased with the outcome. Now, don't you recognize a principle around which the whole of our culture or good chunks of our culture is revolving? You're interested in what the customer, right? Is, was he, that's what he was talking about? What the customer wants? And your concern is to give the customer what the customer wants because the customer is the king. And Socrates says, but these folks are flatterers. <laughs> They're not interested in well-being of these people. They're interested in giving them what they want, what's pleasing to them. Now, we've come to believe that giving people what they want is actually doing what is right. <laughs> but there's far from wants to what is good for people, and main thrust of Socrates' work was to persuade in his subtle uh, and uh, also kind of cynical and snide way to drag people to the position that actually what we should be about is thinking about what is life worthy of living and advocate for that and engage uh, in um, supporting this kind of life. And in the process, he has a dialogue, one snippet of a dialogue I want to read to you with a, name by the, uh, with a person by the name of Callicles. And Callicles is a typical representative, a person who thinks you should be doing with your life what you want to do with your life. Um, so he says, 
um, he who would truly live, that is, who would lead, would live a life worth living, he who would truly live ought to allow his desires to wax to the uttermost and not to chastise them, not to kind of tame your desires, frame and direct your desires. Don't chastise them. Let them run. But when they have grown to their greatest, he should have courage and intelligence to minister to them and to satisfy all his longings. That's a way of life for him. Okay, so, so you've got your desires. You've got to let them, let them run. You've got to be aware of them. And then you've got to have enough courage and enough intelligence so that you can actually minister to these desires. And if you were to live like this, you'd live like a king's son, right? Which is exactly what uh, Calicles said to Socrates. Just imagine a king's son. Wouldn't it be crazy to suggest to him, or if to a daughter, to tame his or her desires? Take what you have. And... So he then sums up his argument to Socrates, and, uh, and he says, you know, truth about human life's, life is this, that luxury and intemperance and license, if they are provided with means, are virtue and happiness. All the rest is a mere bubble. contrary to human nature. That's Callicles. Now, what does Socrates tell him? <laughs> Socrates says, well, you know, the, the virtue of your position, Callicles, is that you are articulating what everybody thinks. <laughs> You're saying it outright, what other people think, but they're not quite articulate in this way. And then he kind of proceeds to undermine his argument. And basically the way he goes about undermining his argument is to suggest, is to build on the idea of basic human insatiability. Now we have, uh, I have a teenager, right? Uh, and uh, younger kids are even better examples of, of this. I mean, the, the, the shelf life of a toy once you buy it. How, how long is it? About a day, <laughs> right? And then the next one needs to be there. Uh, just give your full reign to your desires, right? And the mountain of junk uh, that you have discarded is going to be piling next to you because you will always going to be next to the next new thing that you want to have. And basically, that's what Socrates tells Callicles. There is no end to this searching. There is no rest to it. There is no satisfaction in it because you're constantly uh, searching for, for more. And then he has a, a, an image of souls who are intemperate, who do not chastise their desires, who do not frame their desires, who do not educate their desires, image of those souls in, uh, in hell. Uh, so he says, well, that, that's their destiny, right? And their destiny is going to look like this. They, they are like leaky vessels. Although much, how much, as much as you pour into them, that's how much is going to get out of them. And then he says, these uninitiate, uninitiated or leaky persons are the most miserable. And in Hades, in, the, in hell, they pour water into a vessel which is full of holes out of colander, which is similarly perforated. <laughs> right, that's, that's their punishment. <laughs> uh, in a sense, that's the type of life, if you step back and look, that's being, that's being uh, led. Now, the, the reason I'm, I'm going all the way back, that's, that's like uh, 
fourth, fifth century, fourth, fifth century BC, right? So what we are talking about uh, here. Uh, the reason why I'm going back for this is that it reminds us and gives us opportunity to look with a different eyes into the culture in which we ourselves live. I think we live in a culture that increasingly is organized or that it is organized around the principle that you have seen Callicles uh, articulating. Um, of course, we are, not, we are not in the 60s, right? So we are not just pure bohemians, right? Um, ma majority today are what David Brooks has called, majority of us today are what David Brooks call, has called the Bobos, bourgeois bohemians, right? <laughs> Now, the, the difference with, between ordinary bohemian and bourgeois bohemian is, right, the ordinary bohemian gives himself or herself to the, to the pleasure. That he's, he's kind of uh, um, Callicles, right? Th though even Callicles says that you should have not only those desires to let them grow, but you should have courage and intelligence to minister to them. Now, your bourgeois bohemians are those with enough smarts to concentrate on the means <laughs> and have enough intelligence to pursue those desires. It's a kind of combination of intelligent hedonism, right, would be a way to put it, rather than kind of a dumb uh, hedonism. And obviously, dumb hedonism is self-destructive. Right? Intelligent hedonism uh, is smart enough to know that uh, you've got to control this thing enough so that it can be pleasurable life, right? On the, uh, uh, in, in the long term, not just in the, in the present. Um, uh, th th this, is, this is roughly how we have organized our lives. And what we, what's also happened is that we increasingly aren't willing to ask the question of what makes life worth living. And not just that we as individuals, and maybe we as individuals do, but the culture as a whole is losing spaces where discussion of this issue is at the heart of their endeavor. Now, it used to be that universities were such places. The American colleges were organized around exploration of what makes life worth living. Um, I have uh, talked uh, in many occasions and mentioned the book by, uh, when I talk about this issue, on many occasions I mentioned the book by my colleague Tony Anthony Kronman here at, uh, uh, at Yale. He's a professor of law um, and professor of law who's uh, interested um, primarily in jurisprudence and primarily actually right now in the questions of meaning of life. And he's written a book entitled Education's End on why American colleges and universities have given up on the meaning of life. Um, and he traces the history of American higher learning from the time when the question of the meaning of life was at the very heart of university endeavor. With the founding of Harvard University, it was organized with the meaning of life secured already, and the whole endeavor was to explore what is are the implications of the meaning of life uh, that we know in which uh, what it consists in for our daily endeavors to the area where you have a more secular university in 19th century where you have multiplicity of options of exploring what the meaning of life is all the way to the contemporary setting where the question of the meaning of life what makes life worth living has pretty much disappeared or has been uh, from the from university curricula and has been uh, or at least has been significantly marginalized on why American colleges and universities have given up on the meaning of life. And he has a number of um, explanations of why that's happening. 
And I think they're interesting for us because they don't, they're not just relevant for the university settings, for university administrators and professors. They're also relevant because they reflect also in how the culture in general is moving. And one of the reasons he mentions is because of the dominance of the scientific uh, model of learning. Sciences do not ask question of purposes. They don't ask question of meaning. They try to explain reality. Right? They try to uh, interpret and understand what is, what is going on, but they don't ask what the purpose of it is. And if your majority of in your endeavor is directed toward um, explanation, you won't be asking the question of purpose. Now, then connected with that, it's not just that the question of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of explaining reality is being pursued, but also uh, the question of, well, not only do we know what, here's what the reality is, but we are interested also to know how to get from point A to point B. This is the so-called instrumental rationality, right? I need to have instruments and technical knowledge of whatever sort, in whatever domain, as to how to move. Here I am right now, but I want to be here. And so I'm going to study this. You know, I might study this via business uh, studies. I might study it in engineering. I might study it in a variety of other, other ways. But the point is, I'm learning how to get from point A to point B. But nobody is asking me whether or telling me or, or asking of me to reflect on whether point B is worth getting to at all. right? So, so you have the universities concentrated around the idea of explaining reality and of getting you from point A from point, uh, point B. But who is reflecting on deciding what the points B should be? Right? And so you can be in a situation where you can marshal immense intellectual um, powers in order to serve very inarticulate, not well thought through ends. And the great challenge that we are facing today is how do we find ways to reflect well, to reflect in a, con in a, in a, in a pluralistic setting, of course, about the ends, about the goals that we ought to pursue. Now, part of the reason why in more general culture we don't reflect so much about the ends is because we think that, or the goals, or what life is worth living, what the meaning of life is, is because we have come to believe that each of us has our own meaning of life. Now, if I have my own personal kind of meaning of life, now it's very difficult then to reflect on this bring the questions of truth somehow to bear to this question. Uh, if there is something like human nature, and human nature that also uh, is lived, one can live rightly as a human being, and meaningfully as a human being, well then it's worth reflecting deeply on this. If it's something that I need to choose and decide and craft for myself, then it becomes a more something like my preference. I prefer this kind of way, way of life. And then, uh, sure, you may find a few self-help books that would give you a uh, you know, little direction into how, how you might want to decide this question to yourself. Sure, you might flip on the channel on your TV and listen to one guru or this other preacher that will tell you, you'll come up with something, but it's not worth sustain reflection about what makes life worth living. We live in a, in a setting in which those questions of meaning of life are something like consumer preferences. Now, of course, they're not such, right? The deep questions of meaning of life, even though we choose faith, for instance, all of us are here for freedom of religion. Anybody against it? <laughs> yeah, we've <laughs> We love freedom of religion, right? We can decide, which means if you have freedom of religion, which means I can choose which religion I should have, right? Uh, I can change my religion. So we have choices in this regard, in regard to great questions uh, of life. 
But we sometimes make mistake and we think the choices about faith, choices about meaningful life, are the same kind of choices as what car I should drive <laughs> or what toothpaste I should buy. You know, you look at consumer reports, you consult your gut, you combine the two, and uh, you buy. <laughs> uh, and hopefully you have made a mistake, and if you have made a mistake, you're going to, uh, you know, try to do better next time, right? And so we have similar situation that people are, uh, you, sometimes people say, well, I, I'm into, into this religion now. <laughs> or I'm into this thing now. It kind of fits my own uh, interest at this point. Uh, today I'm into Buddhism, a little bit into yoga, even though I do, well, what's this? Chris, Christoga? Have you heard about Christoga? Uh, it, it's a, it's a Christian version of yoga. Uh, and <laughs> you know, there's Chrislam and there's Christoga. And I, <laughs> It's one of the cheesiest advertisements that I've seen, you know, the, the, the yoga poses. I'm, I'm not opposed to yoga, right? I do yoga, actually. But, but, but kind of one of the cheesiest things where now Christ is at the center uh, of this, and you use this in order to, uh, well. But it's, uh, you, you can be into this, or you can be into that, that. And yet the questions of meaning of life are really not choices in that sense, right? They are kind of the choice that informs all other choices. <laughs> because they are about that which regulates how we make everyday choices in terms of what we should do. And therefore, you can just instruct yourself a little bit about how to uh, choose your meaning of life, how to craft yourself the way you might do uh, with your other individual choices that you, uh, that you take. And um, so, the, so the challenge, I think, in the culture in which we find ourselves, and presumably challenge especially with the youth, with adolescents, is how do you encourage uh, deeper forms of reflection about what makes life worth living in a culture in which people are bombarded from all sides with multiplicity of not just choices, but also kind of a promises of happiness. I think sometimes the consumerist culture is, uh, is our religion. And it does what kind of religion had for a long time promised to do. It promises kind of transcendence, right? To move you out. You're always out into something larger than what, where you are right now. And every new product is just that, right? Every new gadget is just that. Um, and sometimes I feel it's a, uh, you, you know, Marx used to say that religion is opiate of the people. I, I think consumer goods are opiate uh, of the people, right? They kind of closed you off uh, by giving you false satisfaction, close you off from the searches of a deeper kind. I think it would be a very interesting thing to reflect. To what degree is the present day kind of economy and the way economy is organized, to what extent it is deeply secularizing? Not so much secularizing in terms of that it, it will, it, it tells you there's no God. <laughs> but secularizing in a sense that it diverts your attention from deeper issues of life, from transcendence, and directs it onto the flat plane of ordinary life. a retrieval of examined life. Uh, that, I think, is a great challenge. Uh, that's part of the reason why I will teach this course at Yale on uh, life worth living. Um, because I think our students need to find ways of reflecting about 
life worth living. Uh, I will end uh, this portion. Uh, what time do we have? Uh, uh, where am I? 49. W when's the break? Sorry. 9.30? It's 9.50, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, in, I mentioned the book by Tony Cronman about um, education's end, uh, education's uh, end, right, on meaning of life. And in this book he mentions, well, if, if you want to go in today's culture, if you want to find institution in today's culture which addresses the question of meaning of life in sustained way, you must go to churches. I, I told, t Tony is an agnostic Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Tony, when, when have you been last time to a church? <laughs> this would be great <laughs> if you were right. <laughs> but a good deal of church life that's going on actually isn't about the question of what makes life worth living. Churches aren't the sites where this issue is one wrestles with those issues and where that which makes life worth living is nurtured and nourished. And I want to, in, my, in the, the second part of my comments, I want to go now to the kind of church setting uh, and ways in which we can retrieve uh, back the question of what makes life worth living. Okay, I'll stop here. Comments and questions? I'd like to take questions on this first section uh, before we pivot into uh, what might this look like in churches and ministry and preaching, teaching, and youth ministry. But because we've got uh, both a recordation issue for uh, posting to the web and a live stream audience, if you have a question, uh, would you wait for me to bring the, the microphone to you? Who has questions for Miroslav? I guess my question is that uh, in a society where we have multiplicity of views, uh, like your discussion of consumerism, uh, and like I would argue like global capitalism, uh, it kind of demands that you participate in it. Uh, and like any uh, like personal deviation from it is seen as like an aberration in society. So like in which case, like how do you balance the idea that we have so many different views of what like life can take places, but also then like a very monolithic, like making money, you know, having a job is like the meaning of life. <laughs> right. I, I, I think I think it's a it's a very important question in terms of so, so w once you're in, within the system itself, right? I mean, system has its own logic and demands on you, right? And how do you? nurture an alternative, especially if you wish to nurture that alternative within the job that you pursue without actually getting, uh, getting fired. And often what people, pe uh, people do, uh, of course, is they, they act in certain ways within the job, within the economy, it has its own logic, and then they have a, a kind of more private life devoted to uh, other things, transcendence uh, is experienced elsewhere rather than in the job that they, that they have. I, I think there may, be, there may be ways in which to push uh, that within uh, the vocations that we, that we pursue, how to expand those, how to be productive while at the same time not reducing our own productivity in our work to simple means to achieving certain, certain ends. I think the more we can take just the ordinary life and see how in the ordinary life that we have it reaches into something larger than itself. I think the more satisfied we will, we will be. Um, you know, I think that our, our great questions, I'll, I'll speak now more if you, if you wish in, in kind of uh, religiously and secularly neutral terms. Our great questions are about truth about goodness and about beauty. And pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty, they're transcendent pursuits. If I pursue truth as a scholar, I say to myself, I don't care what I think. I care what is true. 
This is my life is devoted to finding out what is true. If I pursue truth for myself on a personal form, I say I don't so much care about what I feel. I want to know what is true about my, my life and align myself with the, with the truth. The same is with goodness, right? I align myself with something that's larger than myself. The same is with beauty. Beauty comes at us, disrupts the, the way in which we are, uh, opens us up to something larger than ourselves. And I think in many ordinary settings in which we find ourselves, whether that's at home being with kids, whether that's at work where we find ourselves, it's possible for us to break out of a confines of everything is about my own desires into something larger than ourselves. And more we manage to do that, the happier lives we lead. More, so to speak, the transcendence breaks into our everyday lives, floods them, and gives them weight, gives them um, meaning, rather than kind of going from one to the other. Uh, Unbearable Lightness of Being is a very, very interesting book which illustrates, I think, what I was, what I'm talking about, where you have this, uh, you know, this guy who's going from one uh, affair to the next, uh, one thing to the, to the next, and everything's so light. Nothing is significant, right? Because it isn't taken into something that's larger than himself. Uh, but a bit being count countercultural might not be a bad thing occasionally. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the, um, the, the nature of dialogue, personal and communal, and the interface. You know, the dynamic that you're talking about seems to me to be a very personal one, a li my life worth living. And the, the meaning with which I live my life has implications for in a more global kind of implication. And so, I mean, there are a lot of questions, but how would you then encourage uh, faith communities to begin the kinds of dialogue that would then sustain the larger dialogue of life worth living in a more global way? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, each of us asks this question in a very personal way. Um, the, the question has emerged to me uh, or, or become most important to me of this very personal, uh, personal uh, issue of life worth living as I was teaching the course on faith and globalization. <laughs> Looking at the kind of global processes that are, that are happening um, and you can, you can analyze what's happening at the, at the kind of global level, but a good deal of the drive that's there for globalization processes is lodged in the heart of each individual, in the desires of individuals. And the desires of individuals, of course, are partly a function of, of what's coming at us on the outside, right? What advertisement, about sketches of a, a life well lived that we receive from a variety of, of sources. But they are a very personal thing, my life, right? But when I say they're my life, of course, the meaning of life, if I simply put it in those terms, this is my life and my meaning, it kind of empties it of meaning itself. It is my decision, my choice, but it's precisely my decision to participate in meaning that's already there, <laughs> in a community that already nurtures, nurtures that, that meaning. And to the extent that my meaning of life isolates me from everybody, it's really modality of meaninglessness of that life that I deem for myself as meaningful. I think the meaning, it may be controversial, of course, statement that I'm making, but I think the meaning lies in our connections with other people, which is to say in communities. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and that's how I think that the question of meaning of life translates to the question of the common, common good. Uh, common, and then, of course, in our setting, also of the global, uh, global good. How one, one can then push us from the heart to the global institution is a million-dollar question that is very difficult to, to, um, to answer. Right? But that we need to do just that, right? Uh, for instance, I have a section in this uh, book that I'm writing on faith and globalization where I, where I think that, uh, that globalization stumbles or, or, or economic successes uh, or any form of attention to everyday 
realities, their uh, ordinary life, they stumble on two human, great human predicaments. One predicament is that of insatiability, and the other is of mortality. Right? Uh, you can, if you have an uh, insatiable, you're, you're grabbing thing and pulling, pouring into nothing, right? The levels of happiness don't increase because the wealth increases or because new gadgets. Uh, come up. I haven't. I, I have an iPhone 5, but I don't think I'm an ounce happier uh, than I was when I had iPhone 4. <laughs> 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 right? Uh, and, and this is this is roughly what our lives are. Um, the same in terms of meaning, uh, meaning question, and uh, our, our mortality. And somehow to make it plain to ourselves to make it plain to our communities, to plug ourselves into a community and make a meaningful life, a way of life, not just for me, but for a whole, whole community. Th that, that is the challenge uh, that, we, that we have. And it, I, I think that's how it will, we will either succeed or that's the reason we will fail. Because none of us can lead meaningful lives on our own. We lead them in communities. Uh, in something larger than ourselves. Uh, thank you for your diagnosis, uh, Professor Wolf. I was curious um, how you might suggest uh, contemporary churches, uh, both mainline Protestant and evangelical churches, how might you suggest these churches have capitulated to this culture of uh, intelligent hedonism? Uh, and so in what ways are the churches participating in reinforcing this culture? So that's the next session. Ah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I have a question related to what you just asked. I work as an interim minister, and as I travel around the country with different congregations, I realize that part of the problem is they are so stuck in personal preference when it comes to governance decisions from the color of the new pew cushions to how are we going to minister to the youth. It's what do I want? What makes me most comfortable? And I really think that's where Protestant civic faith has let these churches down and that they're not governed by a sense of what's God doing next here and how can we listen to it. And I wonder if you could speak to that, how we help our congregations and those who lead who have great brains and think that their preference is going to guide the congregation, how we work with them for that subtle shift into the guidance of the spirit. Because I see that as one of the main problems we encounter in Protestant congregations. Mm. Um, and presumably you're talking about uh, kinds of congregations that uh, on, the pa on the paper and uh, in terms of articulation of their, of their beliefs would, uh, would say, well, uh, you know, love of God and love of neighbor matters much more than the, than the color of this uh, carpet, right? We don't need to persuade them in terms of how to orient their lives in general, right? We just need to kind of figure out how to get from a affirmed orientation of their lives uh, to the actual enacted orientation <laughs> of their lives. Or let's put it not in the third person uh, plural, let's put it in the first person plural and maybe in the first person singular. How do I get myself from uh, affirming something larger than myself to actually in everyday life making those choices? and acting in the ways that uh, reinforce that that, uh, that, 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 that kind of adds up in my own life to something that's meaningful rather than um, articulating it but looking uh, back and always finding the same kind of emptiness seeping in from behind uh, into all my, own, my own life. Um, that I, I think that, that is a great challenge of, of, of of spiritual transformation um, and uh, wh what kind of practices are necessary, what kind of communal engagements are necessary. You know, uh, uh, again, there alone, we are 
we're weak. I mean, you're tossed in all sorts of directions. Uh, e even in families, right? If I don't have my, my wife resist things that I do, who knows what I'll do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Our resistances are a good thing, right? Th they're unpleasant things sometimes. They issue in arguments, right? <laughs> but, but they are absolutely necessary things. And so sometimes I think that kind of the push and pull of communal life, uh, arguments in churches or in youth groups aren't necessarily bad things, uh, provided that the commitments are there to common life, provided the commitment is there. Okay, you, and, you and I are a unit. We are a unit here. We, we disagree. We'll push. And then tomorrow you realize, wait a second, uh, where was I? I mean, I just the other day I was with, with my son, right? Uh, the, you know how you get with, uh, uh, with kids, smaller kids, if they're stubborn, like, no. <laughs> and they wish to do certain things, certain, certain way you get into pull, pull with them, and suddenly you, uh, after you're done with this thing in the middle of the night, what was I doing there, right? You realize that just because there was this resistance, right, you have been bought, pulled to do something you didn't want to do, but you've discovered what you're capable of and what you ought not to have done at the same time. And I think this communal life I I is really fundamental uh, for us. If you keep the vision high, engage in communal, uh, communal practices, uh, hopefully, hopefully we, can, we can come closer to those decisions. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll make one, one comment because uh, I, I also need to mention my mother and uh, my parents in these kinds of conversations because they, for me, they were the keys to, to, to attachment to a uh, Christian way of life. And my mother would always come, her, her gesture, her typical and characteristic gesture when she would talk would always be going something like this, right? And then she would point to what really profoundly matters the most. Whatever happens in Washington, D.C., or Moscow, Beijing, or anyway, is, is incomparably less important than what happens right here in each of our hearts. And I think in many ways, that may be too simple to put it this way, but in many ways this is absolutely the truth. I was wondering if you could talk about, it seems like the shift away from kind of the deeper reflective practice in a lot of ways is stemmed in a culture that's steering great greatly in a very selfish direction and I think the biggest kind of barrier to some of this reflection is well and to kind of faith and faith practices is to reflect and to say that there's something greater than ourselves it's one thing to say there's something greater and it's one thing to say and I'm going to submit myself to that and I think that is kind of the big challenge and why focusing on pew colors is easier because it's a simple decision and doesn't I don't I don't have to submit to having blue cushions at home if I don't like blue and I can deal with that one day a week but could you speak to just sort of that how do we encourage that reflection in this kind of corporateness that I'm hearing in light of this really selfish and well you can't tell me what to do and I don't want to follow have anything imposed on me yeah, I, I thought that this is your job, not mine. I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm a theologian, right? I, I, you know, I deal with ideas, you know, not with... <laughs> um, I, I think you point to, to a very, very important feature of, uh, of, of our lives, individual lives as well. I mean, uh, even when we talk about uh, issues that I mentioned, very abstract ones, that are, but they're very concrete at the same time, truth goodness or beauty. Th there are forms of submission of ourselves to something larger than ourselves. And I think that's at the very heart of our own endeavor to be human beings. To be able to realize that submission, not to anything larger than ourselves, but to right kind of larger thing, to truth, beauty, to God, to Christ is not subtraction from our humanity, but actually fulfillment of it, right? 
so that, so that when I extend myself out of myself, I almost leave myself in the process, right? And I am in something else. It almost seems like, well, I'm going to get lost. But actually, you're found, right? And that's the, that's the beauty of the, of, of the Christian faith. And that's the beauty of human, human lives as well. I mean, you can put it this way. You know, we walk very, very, we're very much rooted on, on the ground, right? We walk on the earth. But our hand is always reaching somewhere for some, some star, right? Not necessarily, and I hope not, from star of success, but for star of tran self-transcendence. And only in this reach, right? only in grasping there, am I truly myself. Only when I go out of myself, am I truly myself. And how do you make that plausible? to people today. I think that's a challenge, but when I talk to people, and even now, you nod, you all nod. If you all nod, uh, I don't see any reason why rest of us and other, uh, in, in a broader culture wouldn't no nod as well, because at some deep level we realize this is really true. I feel fully myself. I feel my life having this weight I, uh, w when, when, I'm, when I'm out of myself, right? How do we find modalities of nurturing? This sentiment, which I think most of us have experienced many times, and most of us deeply desire uh, to practice and not just to feel as uh, something attractive to us. <laughs> uh, parents might be interested in success. The kids, some of them at least, uh, might be interested in interesting things, right? Uh, so, so the uh, versus, boor uh, say, boredom is the big. If for parents, the big uh, kind of no-no out there is uh, kind of my, my kid's going to be uh, kind of a failure in, in life, right? They're not going to uh, succeed. I, for kids, I, I'm thinking if I, uh, if, if I, if I recognize it in my kids, it's got to be fun. It's got to be interesting, right? Um, and those are, those are very, very, to, to me, the both of them are, are very interesting, right? Um, and sometimes a kind of the culture, our culture operates on both of these things. We need success, right? That's the big God in many ways. But the interesting life <laughs> is what many people actually strive for. And you know, in Kierkegaard, has this whole category of interesting, right? As a profoundly inimical, <laughs> if you want, to a well-lived life. And we have been so, in a sense, used to things having to be fun and interesting that we are not even kind of thematizing this as potentially a problematic way of leading one's life. A kind of where interesting becomes a dominant category, but inter if in interesting is dominant category, I it's just another form of meaninglessness and weightlessness, just as success <laughs> in and of itself is another form of being doing just, just that. Uh, either or in Kierkegaard, the category of interesting, with, uh, and the big sin uh, there is boredom, right? That's, the, that's, the, that, that's what you want to avoid by all means, and you do everything you can in order to make it interesting, but it's, it's a, a, a very superficial, of course, way to, to lead one's life. Um, and I think this is a really, in a sense, a good background uh, to what I wanted to, uh, to give you um, in this second session. And I won't actually address right away the question of the church, and and church's uh, mission. But I want to take you back to what uh, is the original idea of all world religions. Now, when I say that, um, some of you may be suspicious. I'm, I'm this uh, all world religions are the same kind of a guy. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty much orthodox uh, Christian. I think that Christ is the key to, to uh, Jesus Christ is the key to, to humanity, key to the whole history. But it's interesting and important for us, I think, to step back and ask the question of 
how other faiths as well, not just the Christian faith, think about life worth living. And in order to do that, I want to give you a bit of a sketch of a shift that took place um, or over many different centuries in different settings from what people call primary religions and what people call secondary or world religions. It's going to place into a relief what we have been discussing even uh, just recently in the conversation after, after the break. Um, and um, secondary religions are religions like Christianity, Islam, prior to that, uh, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, and so forth. They all emerged by, through what some people described as axial revolution, and they emerged out of primary religions. Now, uh, listen to the contrast between these, and then we'll ask ourselves, where are we in our Christian faith <laughs> today in American setting, okay? So that's where we are, where we are headed, and we'll tie it then to the question of, uh, you'll tie it then to the question of youth ministry. Now, so first point, I want to make six points about primary, secondary religions. Uh, first one is secondary religions are two worlds accounts of reality. Primary religions are what one might describe cosmotheistic. Gods, they believe in gods, but gods and spirits are part and parcel of nature, of the world itself. They're not outside of the world, they're in the world, they're powers of the world. Now secondary religions are all operate with these two worlds. They split reality into two spheres. There is a mundane sphere, everyday sphere, and there is a transcendent sphere. The most strongest expression of that is found in the Jewish and especially Christian belief of creation of the world out of nothing. God is categorically different reality than the world. The world was created out of nothing, right? And is in contrast and different than who God is. So two worlds, accounts of reality. Second point. Oh, where is it? page one turn? <laughs> Human beings are addressed as individuals. In primary religion, devotion is tightly linked to social life. People relate to God, to spirits, primarily as a society, as a given group. They're national, if you want, ethnic gods. Secondary religions address human beings as human beings, as individuals. They pull them out and insert them into transcultural communities. Uh, footnote. I, I was talking... Uh, about uh, the, during the break uh, with Karen, right? We were talking about the, the question of, you know, how does church survive uh, here when kind of culture is pushing in the other way? Don't we need uh, kind of also legislative uh, kind of norms, uh, legislation that would kind of support the Christian way of life? And generally what one says, well, yeah, sure, you need, you need kind of support of that sort, but I sometimes want to react in the following, and that's what I, I reacted to Karen. She was a little bit surprised. And I said, if the church needs the world to be the church, it's not worth being a church. If you need laws <laughs> in order to live as a church, uh, think twice about your goal, about your mission, about your identity as the church. It's connected with this idea that kind of the, the contrast, because you have these two accounts of reality, individuals then and communities are, stand in contrast often to their wider environment. Third point, universal claims. Primary religions are local. The gods you worship are your gods, gods of your people, marking your social boundaries making you flourish. Secondary religions make universal claims. What is true, what is just, what is good for all human beings, irrespective of their local culture. 
They may offer a diagnosis of human predicament, problem of sin, problem of suffering or something like that, and the sketch way out of it. Now comes a very interesting bit that's very important. Fourth, they have a good, they operate with a good that is beyond ordinary human flourishing. Primary religions are concerned with ordinary human flourishing. By ordinary human flourishing, uh, we mean health, wealth, fertility, and longevity. Roughly, if you've got all these four, what, are, what more do you need, right? <laughs> health, wealth, fertility, and longevity. And primary religions are all directed completely to serving these basic four goals. Now, secondary religions are concerned with more than ordinary flourishing. For human beings to attain their proper good, in fact, it's not enough for them to attain all these ordinary goals of human flourishing. And they can attain their good even when they fail to have these ordinary needs satisfied that we have. That's true of the Christian faith. That's true of Judaism. Judaism that's true, uh, true of Buddhism, that's true of all world religions. Fourth point is religion is a distinct cultural system. Primary religion, relig uh, in primary religion, religion and society, they kind of merge. To be American is to be a Christian in primary religion. <laughs> uh, or, to name an example from the country that I come, God and the Croats. No matter that all other folks live in Croatia, and not only Croats, but God and the Croats, they, they, they kind of link together, right? The more religion and society are linked, the more like primary religion we look like. Secondary religions are autonomous system, distinct, separate from, diff from culture, not completely parsed apart, but they're distinct from it. And finally, the secondary religions have to do, uh, have to do with, uh, uh, are concerned with transformation of world re re worldly realities. Primary religions are marked by something like you can describe it, a mood of ascent. Uh, life is what life is. You kind of have to accept life. It's very different than what we experience today. But very close, to those of you who are readers of Nietzsche, that's what Nietzsche means by affirmation of life. Right? In Nietzsche's sense, what, what life is ought to be simply affirmed. Now, secondary religions, uh, they want to transform world re realities. And that starts with transformation of ourselves, our bodies, our spiritualities, and the transformation of the world. Now, one of the key elements here is the one that has to do with human flourishing. Are the goals of our flourishing identical with health, wealth, fertility, and longevity, or are they larger than that? To be a human being is to reach to something that's larger than that. That's what the, the uh, kind of fundamental issue. Um, Often I tell that maybe some of you have heard me speak about the story of, of Job just in this regard. Some people think that the story of Job is about the big question of theodicy, right? To kind of resolve somehow the problem of, of evil. I think the Job, the book of Job, is about what's primary in your life. And here's how the story goes. I'll tell you very briefly. I'll go then to church and we'll open it up for, uh, for your conversation and discussion. Um, Job, uh, blameless and upright, feared God and turned away from evil. 
And then God has blessed his work, protected uh, Job, and Job was the greatest uh, man in the East. And the drama of the story begins um, with a dispute up in heaven between Satan and God. Satan, um, kind of incarnation of destructive suspicion. You know, that's a master of suspicion <laughs> is what you've got at work uh, there. He claims that Job basically is adherent of a primary religion, right? What is he saying? Well, why do you think, he says to God, Job is so devoted to you? It's clear why he is. You've blessed him. He's, he's got kids. He's healthy. He's wealthy. Oh, of course, what more does he need? He's going to serve you just because of that. And God disagrees with Satan, right? That, that's not my servant Job. <laughs> and the only way to figure out who's right, Satan or God, is to put Job to the test. It's not enough for Job to tell you what he does, right? Because we, tell, we say all sorts of things to ourselves and to others. Right? You've got you to gotta live it, actually. And the story is about just this proof <laughs> on Job's part and on God's part that Job is in fact his primary concern is not his own well-being that he doesn't serve God because of that but he serves God for God's sake which put it differently, to be a human being before God is to serve God for God's sake. And of course, Job, Job wins, right? After a great deal of distress. Uh, and we are all troubled about this distress that he goes through. I'm troubled about it. I think, well, especially those kids. You know, it's okay, Job, right? But... <laughs> But the interesting part of the Job story is not that Job kind of ends up with nothing. He proves that he serves God for nothing and then ends up with twice as much as he had before, right? So the idea is not wealth, fertility, longevity, and so forth aren't important. But they don't rank above <laughs> attachment to something that makes us, as human beings, to be who we truly are and find fulfillment. In some ways, you can see also the story of Abraham in the same light. Right? Uh, you can take uh, even the story of near sacrifice of Isaac in the same scary light as you uh, read the book of Job as the kind of primacy of faith primacy of attachment to God. Now, in a contemporary culture, uh, both Job and Abraham are interesting cases. I mean, I've just posted something the other day on my Facebook and Twitter on, on Abraham and uh, as a kind of model, model parent in his faith, right? Of course, the reaction was amazing, right? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sacrifice Isaac, you know? <laughs> you talk, come to me to talk to a youth group about, uh, you know, primacy of, of God, and there, there, there's this, this uh, great hero of faith, you know, who sacrificed, almost sacrificed his son. Uh, because of his attachment to this, this higher, higher end. And I think that may be, I mean, the story is troubling, no, no, no question about it. So is Job's story in, in many ways, very disorienting uh, as a story. Um, and especially in our own culture, uh, especially in the culture of modernity, because affirmation of ordinary life is probably the most significant idea uh, in the West since the 16th century. Anything that rattles on the affirmation of ordinary life can be right. <laughs> because we think this is the highest of all values that we have. Right? 
And if you have, but when you have this world faith, and th that's the reason why I mentioned these world faiths, right? Because they remind you that this is not just some Christian peculiarity. This has been, in fact, majority of humanity through the whole centuries have affirmed primacy of the transcendent and have felt that it is deeply problematic of us to, be, to have our gaze completely placed down to the kind of flat plane of ordinary existence. And you have it in extreme cases expressed uh, in the stories of Abraham and in the stories of Job. And the challenge, I think, is uh, how do we make plausible in today's environment that actually attachment to something larger than ourself, to God, can matter more than life itself? I started with Socrates, right? That's exactly the story of Socrates, isn't it, right? If you have his apology, right? He's willing to be condemned to death just because he wants to stand by his principle. And not only that, and in the more, more interesting case is not just apology, but Crito, the dialogue. And the Crito, the dialogue, the Crito, uh, the, the issue is this. A number of other issues swirl, but, but the main issue is this. Will Socrates flee the imprisonment so as to avoid being punished or be, so as to avoid execution? He was unjustly sentenced, right? He knew that. <coughs> that that's what apology is about. But now the question is, will he even flee unjust punishment even though he himself thinks that it's not the right thing to do? And Socrates stays with it, right? You may, you may disagree with Socrates or not, but, but keep in mind how much principle, attachment to something larger than himself matters to Socrates. He's willing to die for this. I think what this, <coughs> this is one of the fundamental issues, I believe that we are facing today. And connected with this, it's interesting to me what I perceive is happening in the kind of Christianity, um, in the Christian faith and Christian churches, along with this cultural fundamental ori orientation to affirmation of ordinary life. I think in many ways, Christian churches are starting to see themselves as a supporters primarily of ordinary flourishing. It's not so much their goal is to call people to something larger than ordinary for flourishing or to put it this way, to frame this ordinary flourishing in something that gives meaning to the ordinary flourish, but to support ordinary flourishing. We want blessing. We want uh, to succeed. The faith provides the boost uh, for it. We want comfort when we have failed. The faith provides a kind of cushion where we can uh, pillow, where we can kind of uh, weep a little bit uh, or, uh, or get our wounds uh, kind of uh, healed. And that's not an argument against this. My, my argument is not that the church ought not to do that. Those are very important functions the church has. But the fundamental issue is, where does the primacy lie? Can we find ways in which we can orient our lives around something that's larger than ourselves and just in this way affirm the goodness of the ordinary life? Remember, Job gets returned, everything returned. Uh, Abraham gets his son returned. Ordinary life is affirmed, but it's framed. And only when it's framed does it have its own proper weight. I think that's the lesson of the wisdom of humanity. And that's the lesson of the wisdom of the Old Testament. And I could, of course, exegete Gospels uh, and the life of Christ 
and you'd get to the same lesson as well. Um, what does that mean in particular for our young people? For their search for meaning, for their search for significance, for their critique uh, of established kind of structures as they perceive them, for their critique that may not be articulated, but their critique that may be voting with their own feet and activities and uh, rebellions. Um, I think those are some of the fundamental questions about orientation of our lives, orientation of our churches and the church's ability to actually provide help in the most fundamental kind of way. Following your, your logic, you're saying that um, Christianity is now behaving more like a secondary religion. Like a primary religion. Oh, I thought you were saying the secondary religion applies more to the um, comfort and the nurture. So, so primary religion, almost sole purpose of them, is health, wealth, uh, fertility, and prosperi prosperity. All secondary religion have goals for human beings that are larger than these natural forms of our flourishing. So maybe at its inception, Christianity was more like a secondary religion. But now but it's behaving like a primary religion turning to the detriment of the people who are interested in the bigger picture. Uh, you youth. Know that, youth. Yeah. You, you know, that, that, that's in a sense what I'm suggesting, right? And I, uh, there are other, there's one other way in which Christian faith, other, other prim, uh, secondary religion, have become like primary religion. They have merged often with, their, with the nation, with ethnic group, and so forth, right? Uh, so it becomes uh, almost like God is the God of a particular group, right? And similar way, God is a God of natural flourishing of this group. And the temptation of Christianity, uh, as of other world faiths, but we are interested primarily in, in, in our own faith, our temptations are just those. Identify God with nation, then God and America God and uh, Poland uh, and God and so forth. They're kind of aligned. Uh, and the other one is aligned our natural flourishing with our belief in God simply, right? And you see how two are tied together. Your nation uh, thrives and we as individuals thrive and this is the purpose of God. Right? Uh, I think there are strong tendencies just in that direction. It, there have been throughout the history uh, probably more association of God in a particular nation than there are today because globalization is breaking down those kinds of bar barriers. But today, I think more of a connection between our natural forms of, of flourishing and God. Uh, and, and God. Now, the, the difficulty with the second one is that in fact God wants you to flourish. <laughs> So temptation is so much more seductive, right? Because you can easily say, didn't Jesus heal the sick? Of course he did. Didn't he feel the hungry? Of course he did. Didn't he raise the dead? Of course he did, those who premature died. Didn't he return the kids to their, to their parents? Didn't he bless the children? Isn't God for fertility, for longevity, for health, for, for wealth? You see it in the ministry of Jesus. So there is this strong strand, certainly in Christianity, certainly in Judaism, certainly in Islam as well, but in Christianity again, most importantly, which affirms this, uh, but then we sometimes simply run with that. <laughs> it turns to be love of God without a love of neighbor, without love of God. It turns to be seek ye first all these things and then maybe God can, will be added to you on top of it rather than seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. So, so the whole thing is really in, in the Christian faith is about order of priorities. It's not about valuing one rather than the other. It's valuing both, but what's the, what's the order of priorities, right? And this shifting of the order of priorities 
twists the whole Christian faith in a direction in which it malfunctions in major ways. Uh, what, you, what you've been saying is reminding me a lot about some things I've read from H. Richard Niebuhr. Uh, one thing that he wrote, uh, he wrote a sermon called The Logic of the Cross, and he talks about the primary principle of living, and uh, he talked about, I think, what you're saying is primary religion as examples of the, the primary principle of, of living being uh, a fear of death, and so trying to outlast, trying to prolong life as a way to, to, to basically um, just prolong the inevitable um, death, which then is you know, a form of annihilation versus what he says is the logic of the cross, which is going through death into new life. So that was one thing that it, this kind of reminded me of is, is what he talked about in that sermon. But then also what you were saying um, about primary and secondary religion kind of reminded me of, uh, of his work, Christ and Culture. Is there anything that you would say about like his five different kind of understandings of rela the relationship between Christ and culture and where we are today? Um, yeah, uh, I can point you to, uh, to my uh, a public faith, which has a, a bit of a discussion uh, of this. I tend to think that uh, this is a great book, right? It, it's kind of mapped the relationship between Christ uh, or the faith, uh, but particularly Christ more specifically. Uh, and uh, uh, and the culture, and I think my basic gripe with uh, with uh, H. Richard Niebuhr is that it, those are kind of the pure types, and I don't see anything like it happening. I, in fact, I don't see situations. Uh, I don't see any uh, possibility of church just be transforming society, church just hovering above, church just being opposed to society. In fact, when you observe. Uh, throughout the history, what you find is that there is no single stable way to relate to the culture as a whole. Why is there not such a stable way? Because culture as a whole is too complex. Already in part laden by grace and resisting grace, all sorts of things are happening in the culture and therefore I think that sometimes some aspect of culture has to be, have to be rejected other aspects of culture can be celebrated, yet other aspect of aspects of culture can be, uh, ought to be transformed, and all, all ought to be framed in the expectation of the coming of the kingdom of God. So there's not a single way in which church relates to, to a culture. There are multiplicity of ways uh, in different settings going different, different ways, uh, resistances, affirmations, celebrations, all of it happening at the same time. It really doesn't matter how you relate to the, it matters, uh, commitment to the center, to Christ, determines uh, ad, in ad hoc way how you relate to, to a culture. Uh, there's no model to capture that. It's life. What do you think of this movement towards mission work and mission trips that the church is taking um, these days? Is it an effort to connect Boost to the Boost resumes? For Pardon? colleges, boost resumes for colleges. Oh. <laughs> is, it, is, it that, is it an attempt for the church to connect to the bigger picture, or is it our projection that you couldn't possibly be happy without health, wealth, and and the four basics? So we're giving that to people in need. Or it, I think it's kind of both. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you can do it badly, and you can do it well. Right? And to do it badly would be uh, see yourself, see ourselves as some kind of uh, 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 saviors, um, instill that complex into uh, savior complex into teenagers, uh, and then take them take them on, uh, you know, and unleash them uh, uh, upon unsuspecting uh, and very <laughs> smart uh, and often very sophisticated people who happen to be uh, less privileged than they are. You know, that would be just the worst case scenario. The best case scenario would be for them to discover something that's larger than themselves, uh, to give themselves to it and in the process discover who they, who they are when they come there to learn that they have to, uh, they, 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 can, they can receive more than they are able, able to give for partnerships to be uh, established 
um, th those would be those would be uh, extraordinary things. Or to take uh, a phrase about those uh, those trips from a very good friend of mine, those can be pilgrimages, right? <laughs> Spiritual pilgrimages. Everything I've said, I've learned from Skip <laughs> on those things. <laughs> but I stole it from a book, A Mile in My Shoes. Uh, author's name is Hudson. He says, mission trips are spiritual pilgrimages. We need to go as pilgrims, not tourists. Receivers, not givers. Listeners, not talkers. Right? Learners, not teachers. Right? And that transforms the relationship with the mission partner over time. I remember, since you mentioned mission trips, I remember a comment um, that a Mexican pastor, my, I grew up in California, we went to Mexico building homes, and, and the dialogue between my youth pastor and this Mexican pastor was the American pastor came went down, it might not have actually been my pastor, but his comment to this Mexican pastor was, how can you and your people in this community serve God with all this poverty around. And the Mexican pastor responded, and he says, how can you as Americans serve God with everything that you have? And so I'm just wondering if you could kind of a, just globalize. Everything you've said makes sense from an American perspective, but I think in more of a global perspective, when we've got third world countries with very little, how does this same mentality flesh itself out? Uh, I, I really think the, the question is the other way around. Uh, the same mentality actually fleshed itself out in a situation that was just about as bad as the most of the third world settings. That's where it came about. That's when Christian faith emerged, kind of on marginal communities uh, living uh, very often uh, kind of meager, meager lives as the majority of the world uh, live today. I think the big question, I, uh, in fact, is the one that Mexican pastor asked, asked us, how does it flesh itself out here? And you, how, do you, how do you manage it? How do you live, live this? Um, in a sense, uh, it's much more designed for a situation of need, much less designed for a situation of immense allure of constant stream of goods that come at us uh, and that kind of pulls us into into itself, um, it, and it's it's uh, my experience is also similar with the question of uh, say the Odyssey question or where is God? Uh, this question is alive to people who suffer, but people who suffer, I've. I've seen cases, but much fewer than in the middle class, Western, relatively affluent settings, who in their suffering actually reject God. They have questions. They have, they're troubled by it. Uh, but they also hang onto God because they know that in many ways, God is their agony, but also God is their hope. So kind of combination of both the agony and the struggle between the agony of being with God and, uh, and the hope of being with God as well is, is such a fundamental uh, experience to people. Whereas you know, people in more affluent settings have luxury of simply you know, giving up on, on things. Um, and I, I, so my sense is that that Christian faith can be and often is a much more alive in settings like you describe of the Me Mexican uh, pastor. I mean, I've ex I've seen it in my own life early on. Uh, I've seen it in uh, many environments in the world. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what are the modalities of our own poverty in the affluent settings? Um, and what does it mean for us in terms of how we relate to those who are impoverished?
when you were speaking about uh, the Abraham near sacrifice of Isaac and people's um, you know very visceral reaction against that passage it reminded me of a a time when I was preparing to preach on it and read a commentary that really helped me to see it in a different way which is parents are sacrificing their children all the time and the question is what God are they sacrificing their children to and we've been talking about that yesterday and today about the God of success and how but I mean part of sacrificing is letting go I mean we have to let go of our children in some ways but to what are we letting them go and to what are we um, yeah yeah giving them over to to what are we delivering them right yeah I mean it's not that simply uh, there is an element of letting letting go as a sacrifice but there is an element and Skip was talking about which is which is this God Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, if college admission is I mean it's almost like it is an active sacrifice, not just letting the go. Mm. But I'm going to streamline you so that you'll fit into this college that I have designed for you to go mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. And um, and yet we think nothing of that. I mean, we get all appalled right. about Abraham laying Isaac on the altar, but we don't think anything about the altars that we're laying our kids on. Well, you know, and, and the difference for us is, uh, it's very good that you raised that question. I think it, it kind of reminds us of the different, different perspectives that one can have. And the difference, of course, uh, it is that along with the affirmation of ordinary life in contemporary culture, inflicting pain or taking life is the worst thing you can do. Uh, that, for instance, the children, uh, f- uh, physical punishment for children is part and parcel of that. Uh, in earlier cultures, people thought nothing of it. And in fact, they would have thought that varieties of ways in which we inflict psychological pain on children in order to direct them in whichever way we want them to go is a worse thing than the spec. We can't think that way, right? Because for us, experience of physical pain on inflicting physical pain which goes along this affirmation of ordinary life, is absolutely uh, kind of non-negotiable. That, that's our cultural good. In many places in the world, it, it isn't a non-negotiable. And that's why often we find, for instance, between some of the Islamic uh, settings, more traditional settings, or even Christian traditional settings, and the Western, we find that we don't know how to talk about this thing. Because the, the sets of values that we bring about are very different. And I think that also, uh, w- without wanting to minimize the horror of, uh, of uh, Abraham's near sacrifice, and indeed in the Bible itself, right? You have a, you have a sturdy resistance against that. In, in some people uh, argue that even Abraham's near sacrifice is precisely an argument against sacrificing one, one children to the, to the Moloch and so forth. Uh, but but a part of our horror is because we just can't imagine inflicting pain, let alone uh, sacrifice. I think the other thing that uh, we often miss is that poverty of spirit is not the same as poverty of physical needs. Um, I I grew up in a third world country and uh, I learned that I was poor in my SOC 101 class when I was, <laughs> you know, in university. And I could almost have argued, you know, that's not or feeling that you can't accomplish or feeling that you're deprived or something like that. So I think in ministering to, to people, your judgment about where they are spiritually may not be the reality that they, you know, they may be experiencing. They may be very receptive to um, spiritual nourishment and perhaps what you think they need, you know, the whole big white house with a picket fence might not necessarily be the, the things that they're, they're hungry, hungry for. So it's just, I think, to some extent, when you talk about the primary, um, you know, looking at the, the primary church as need some of the I mean, if I look now how I grew up, I, it's total poverty, right? I never had any idea that that was the case. Uh, I was, a, you know, we were all happy, uh, ha- happy, you know, grew up in a family where my, my na- I had a nanny, I have two, two rooms and a nanny, yeah, right, in the room because she didn't have any <laughs> place to live. So we were, 
And you know, this woman would uh, uh, completely al alone, untaken, uh, not been taken care of. Husband died, the widow. Every single day, she was singing. Right? There's kind of the, the the beauty of the joy. I mean, uh, I devoted my uh, dedicated my first book to her because she was an amazing human being, totally impoverished and totally beautiful, and and a kind of. A sense of sense of s herself and her own dignity and, uh, and 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 who she was. I mean, uh, I rarely encounter people, uh, no matter how wealthy they are. They they, they may they may walk through life with John Wayne swagger, but that just shows how <laughs> how little self assured uh, deep down uh, they are, right? Um, I I fully f fully see that. I think that the retrieval or something of that. Is it, it, it's this amazing power of, of the spirit uh, and and the, and, and the beauty of, of human life. Just to go back to this idea of what's primary, um, it seems to me that both the Job and the Abraham stories also illustrate a, a disordered priorities that the churches are also complicit as, as that family becomes the primary. Family comes yeah, yeah. to be what is idolized, yeah, yeah. and our yeah. children. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that I, I think that's right. It, it's it's good for us to step back and see. Uh, I mean, th there are obviously two two tendencies that we need to kind of keep in mind. One is a complete bre breakdown, right, of of close ties, uh, with with horrendous consequences. On the other hand, y you have this idolization of the of the nuclear. Uh, family and uh, as if that's uh, uh, all there is actually uh, to life. So, so, so between the two, uh, uh, kind of sense that um, there's something larger that family also benefits by being inserted in something larger than the family I I itself. Uh, not only we don't we have extended families, but we don't reach into wider communities. It ends up being self-insular. And I think it, it uh, works itself to detriment of our family life. 